Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to Goddess Kring Radio podcast number 23 on March 23rd, 2017. I just got back from having Thai food dinner with my father, and it was fairly pleasant. I am just thinking and having some insights about my life. My therapist recommended that I read a book called The Body Keeps the Score, Healing from Trauma. I forgot the author's name. I got the audiobook version because I don't really like reading. I love to write and I love to record my voice and I love to listen to music and audiobooks and videos and movies. I'm more auditory when I learn and absorb things. I'm a bit dyslexic, so when I read a book, I'm very slow and I don't seem to retain it, but if I hear it, if I hear an audiobook, I seem to retain it and I learn best if actually if I hear something and I take notes. That's when I really get it into my into my brain and my body and my mind. But I was going to say I'm really grateful that I'm alive. Uh, I think about suicide every day. I've never attempted suicide and I hope I never do. I talked about last week how I had two past life regressions where I did commit suicide. I hung myself from a tree as a young 14-year-old girl pregnant with a black man's baby and my father shot him. We were white, he was black. And so I killed myself. And then in the other lifetime, I was a 40-year-old Japanese man and I did Harry Carey because I was ostracized from the village, long story. But those are two lifetimes I remembered in past life regression. And I don't really know if there is such a thing as reincarnation for sure or not might just be a metaphor that my subconscious invented, like a dream, like a symbol, symbolizing the fact that I felt trapped and like I wasn't allowed to be who I really wanted to be, or I had to conform to what other people expected of me. And in this lifetime, there's a similar thing. Although in this lifetime, I live by myself in an apartment with my cat, And I have the freedom to be naked for a living. I model for artists and I've done that for 25 years. And so on that level, I am free to to be myself, to be nude and natural in front of artists and to pose for them. It's very physically uh, painful at times and kind of demanding. The older I get, the harder it gets physically in terms of my stamina, although I'm still pretty healthy. But on some other levels, I feel almost like I have post-traumatic stress disorder. And the reason why I have post-traumatic stress disorder, I think, is because of my traumatic childhood. My parents divorced when I was four, and I don't remember that being horrible. I remember going back and forth between my mom and my dad and my grandparents who helped babysit. But I remember a series of shocking things happening, like my mom dated some abusive men, abusive boyfriends. I remember fights. I remember seeing my mom get slapped by one of her husbands. I remember the biggest trauma I remember is when I was nine and my mom decided we were going to move out of San Diego and live in our car and make our way up to Whidbey Island, Washington to maybe buy some land and build a house on five acres of land out in the woods. Uh, But on the way, we lived in Petaluma, California and at Evolution Art Institute where my mom dated the instructor and we had, we kind of lived in our car and then we lived in his house with him and then they broke up, I think, and then we decided to go to Whidbey Island. There was just a series of My mom got married and divorced, married and divorced, married and divorced four times. She met the guy she stayed with for 30 years when I was a senior in high school. So basically, when I lived with my mom, we were always on welfare. My mom is an artist. She's very smart. She's mystical, spiritual into Eastern um, Advaita Vedanta non-duality and Krishnamurti and lots of really intelligent, interesting philosophies. But in terms of our actual physical life, we were always living in poverty and I always had food and I always had clothes and 
etc. But I went to three different schools in fifth grade, which was very stressful, and kids picked on me in public school. And then my mom put me in alternative art-oriented school, which was much better because nobody picked on me. But basically, we moved around a lot, and there was a lot of shocking changes, like my mom had to suddenly sell the piano, got rid of the piano, couldn't play the piano anymore. She married these different guys that were not really great stepfathers to me, except for the last husband, who actually died two years ago suddenly of a heart attack at home in bed, which was another traumatic thing that happened. Lately, my post-traumatic stress from different childhood events, I was neglected too as a child. Both my parents neglected me in various ways. I didn't really get a certain kind of nurturing of my self-esteem and validation of my self-esteem. And I realized the reason why is because of part of the way my parents were raised. They were both neglected by their parents and their parents and their parents and their parents. And so maybe this has been going on for many generations. I don't know. I know that my parents did the best they could. I'm still friends and love both my parents. I still see them both. My mom is on Woodby Island. My dad lives here in the city, although my dad might move to Florida. Long story. He has a new girlfriend, so he might move so and retire in Florida, and that's great. I want him to be happy. I want him to be healthy and happy and enjoy his older age. I want my mom to be happy. So I don't want to talk too much about my parents because they're very private people. And that's why I don't talk very much about other people because people in my life are private. In my boyfriend, I'm still with him. I've been with him for two and a half years and he's a very private person. He's in a rock and roll cover band and he's a photographer for a living. But he's very private and has no online presence aside from his band. So I won't talk about him either. I'll just talk about me because it's safe for me to talk about me because I own the copyright to me. This is Shannon Kringen, Shannon Nicole Kringen. I was born on October 25th, 1968 in San Diego, California, and I'm on this earth to make sure that I don't commit suicide in this lifetime. I know that I have committed suicide, I'm pretty sure, in at least two other lifetimes, if not more than that. I have been actually afraid to go under past life regression ever since that one time where I did that. It was in my early 20s and I'm now 48. That was a really intense experience going under hypnotherapy and past life regression and seeing my two lifetimes where I committed suicide and sadly I didn't see any other lifetimes. And I think I got scared after that and I've never tried it since. So I'm a Scorpio Earth monkey. I have my sun in Scorpio, moon in Capricorn, Venus in Sagittarius, Taurus rising. Um, I forgot what else, Mercury in Libra. I don't even remember the rest of the aspects that I have in my chart. But I will just say that I feel like my mission in this lifetime is to not kill myself. If I can just get through this lifetime without committing suicide, I think that will be an amazing accomplishment to just let myself live my natural life. And then when nature decides it's time for me to rest in peace, it's time for me to rest in peace, but not until then, not until when, whatever age I am, when my body decides it's going to pass away naturally without any premature, you know, speeding up of the process of death. So I sometimes think, though, that when my parents pass away, because I don't have any kids, I never got married, I never had kids, I'm 48, and I feel kind of trapped in terms of my income, but when my parents pass away, my my mom is 69, I think my dad is 71, he's going to turn 72, I think, soon, they're both pretty healthy, so they might live uh, quite a while longer. And then when they pass away, I almost feel like it's, you know, I can get some morphine and just check out of here. But I'm just being honest. But my retirement plan is euthanasia. No, I'm wondering if that's what Donald Trump is going to propose, that old, um, if you're low income and you're a senior and he cuts all the funding for all of the um, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Meals on Wheels, you know, whatever senior stuff they have, maybe we should all just like commit suicide. Maybe that's the new American plan to make America great again. Just uh, euthanize all the old people that are poor and only rich old people can can live in this country. (coughs) I know I'm a little cynical. Uh, Somebody told me that he thinks Bernie Sanders is going to be the next president and I'm like, you're out of your mind. 
I wish. I love Bernie Sanders. <clears throat> I love democratic socialism. The only way that Bernie Sanders is ever going to be president of the United States or anybody as ethical as him who wants to distribute the wealth more equally in a democratic socialism kind of way is if our system is not as corrupt because basically the United States is a corporation. It's not really a country. This is not a democracy. The USA is a corporation that we all work for to some extent. And I feel like the bankers and the Wall Street and the prison and the military industrial complex, they don't like Bernie Sanders because he's like, hey, 1%, we don't want the millionaires and billionaires running the country. We want a democracy. We want raises, wages raised for the poor and the middle class and wages lowered for the ultra uber wealthy who have more power than the poor people and the middle class people. So we want more solar power. We want better mass transit. We want more ethical laws. We want single, single payer nonprofit health care. So those are reasons in which I call Donald Trump and his entire administration, all the people that he seems to like and is appointing to his cabinet. I call them embezzlers and economic terrorists because they want to increase the military budget. Of course, they want to screw over the veterans, though. The military budget is going to be raised by $54 billion. Let me guess, though, none of that goes to the veterans. That all goes to just money used to buy weapons, to perpetuate war and military bases and maybe like stupid like uniforms and stupid things that they don't really need expensive things that make them a profit in some way it's not actually going to help the veterans who actually deserve the best health care that there is for their post-traumatic stress disorder maybe i i am somebody who's not a fan of the military and i would never want to join the military i don't trust the military at all and I don't want to shoot people. I don't want to go to war. If, if I ever had to go to war, I'd be a nurse. I'd say, okay, well, I'll be a nurse. I will patch people up. I'll, I'll even patch the enemy up, the so-called enemy, because I don't believe in this whole us versus them. They are the enemy. Friendly fire. I mean, fire is fire, whether it's friendly fire. So, yeah, I'm sorry, but I could never join the military. But I have tremendous amount of empathy and compassion for people who have post-traumatic stress disorder that are in the military. Even though I've never been to combat, never been to war, I definitely have some post-traumatic stress disorder from my childhood. And I need to turn my phone off. Sorry about the text message noise. So post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm learning about it. I want to also get a book called Yoga and the Quest for the Authentic Self or the Quest for the True Self. I think the book is called Yoga and the Quest for the True Self. This other book I have, audio book that my therapist recommended called The Body Keeps the Score, How to Heal from Trauma, recommends that other book, Yoga and the Quest for the True Self. So. It's saying that basically if you have post-traumatic stress disorder, you can do talk therapy, you can do medication. That only helps to some extent. The book is saying that what really helps people with post-traumatic stress disorder is massage, music, dance, theater, art, if you resonate and love any of those things. Basically learning how to relax. Yoga is a form of learning how to relax the body, mind, heart, and soul, and being around animals and plants and nature, exercise can change the biochemistry of the brain, and there's neuroplasticity in the brain, and I'm finding myself feeling upset right now because there's a siren out my window. Oh my gosh, I've noticed like several sirens today, like at least three or four sirens today, Part of me doesn't even want to live in the city. But the reason why I live in the city is because for a living, I model for art classes, which are all over the place. I go all the way from Tacoma to Whidbey Island to Bainbridge Island, Vashon Island, Kirkland, Redmond, many different art schools in Seattle, north, south, east, and west. 
I've also modeled in San Diego, California, Trenton, New Jersey, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, where else have I modeled? Portland, Oregon. I've figure modeled, you know, for I'm the nude person that they draw and paint and sculpt. And sometimes I model for photographers. Uh, but mostly I just, so I live in the city because I need to commute all over the place. I was going to say that I feel a little bit trapped, but post-traumatic stress disorder, I want to work on healing from, but I don't know if I'm ever really going to heal, but thankfully I never got into drugs or alcohol. I've always been into music and art and animals and plants and I'm kind of a loner and I kind of live in a dream world. I listen to a lot of Tom Petty music and Tori Amos music. And in fact, today I was going for a nice long walk in nature by myself, listening to Tori Amos's um, 1996, gosh, what's the name of the record though? Boys for Pele with the song on it. Um, caught a light sneeze, etc. Lots of really amazing songs on that album. That's a masterpiece. And Tom Petty's new album, Hi Hypnotic Eye, I really love. I'm going to go see Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers when they come to Safeco Field with my dad in August of, of 2017. And I'm also going to hear Temple Grandin speak about animal behavior on Vashon Island with my dad on, I think, June 10th. She's an amazing autistic woman. So on, on, those, on those notes, that my life is a good thing. I was going to say, I feel happy that I never are grateful. I never got into drugs or alcohol. A lot of people that have post-traumatic stress disorder do things like cut themselves or have like sadomasochistic like habits that they do to hurt themselves or they, they do a lot of drugs or drink a lot. I've never liked alcohol. I couldn't be an alcoholic even if I tried. I, I hate alcohol, actually. I've tried to get into drinking wine to relax, but I don't like wine. I don't like beer. I like an occasional blended strawberry margarita, but that's about it. I don't even really like the alcohol. I just like the fruit and the ice. So I kind of like smoothies, you know, like a strawberry smoothie. I would like way more than a than a um, margarita with alcohol in it. So I'm really not into alcohol. I never got into drugs. Uh, I don't like smoking pot at all. I've tried several times. I, I just get paranoid and sleepy and want to lie down. And I hate inhaling smoke. In Amsterdam, once I ate hash. That was awful. I thought my skin was going to fall off. And I saw white dots everywhere. And I felt totally like I had brain damage. And it scared the heck out of me. I didn't enjoy it one minute. And I've only been drunk twice. And the room started spinning and my words started slurring and I got scared. I thought, oh my God, I have brain damage. What's wrong with my brain? I was afraid that my brain would never be normal again when I was drunk. So I don't really respond well to drugs. The only drug I ever liked was morphine. When I was in the hospital, I had breast reduction surgery. And I woke up feeling happy and euphoric and I thought, wow, I'm, I think I'm just happy. This is a natural high. I remember thinking, this is a natural high. This is natural. This can't be a drug. And they said, oh no, you're on morphine. And I'm like, oh my God, morphine is good. So I guess I liked morphine. So if I ever commit suicide, I'm going to get me some morphine. <laughs> but that's when I'm really old. I figure I have to make it till at least 65. You know, my retirement plan is if I'm still miserable and my parents pass away, maybe I will just check out of here. I don't know, but hopefully not. But sorry, I know that's not even legal, so I shouldn't say that. So never mind. <laughs> just being honest, but no. There's a crisis clinic hotline, 206-461-3222. I actually have that memorized. So if you're in crisis, please call the crisis clinic hotline. It's free. I think it's 24 hours a day. I call it sometimes. It doesn't really help a whole lot, but they tell me to drink a cup of tea, take a shower, do something to soothe yourself, pet your cat, go for a walk, listen to Tom Petty. I mean, what else can you do when you're feeling upset? But I never, okay, my point was, sorry, I got on a tangent. I never got into drugs or alcohol uh, to deal with my post-traumatic stress. But what I have done is I've compensated because I feel very scared and I feel kind of like I'm an orphan. Like my parents were distracted and I feel like they didn't focus on me enough to help me build my self-esteem and my sense of safety and security and identity. And so what I did was I found music. I found Tom Petty music and Tori Amos music, 
well, later in life, I found it. Tom Petty I discovered when I was 11 years old, and it really helped me a lot. His music really helps me a lot in many different ways. Uh, he's my tie to California. He's my tie. He's from Florida, but I associate him with California. He lives there now. His music is just very inspirational to me, and I'm happy that he still creates music. His new album is called Hypnotic Eye, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. His band Mud Crutch I love, and the Traveling Wilburys. I just love all the different things. He worked with Johnny Cash. He worked with George Harrison. He's worked with amazing people, Roger McGuinn from The Birds. And I love Tori Amos, and I painted shoes for her. So basically, music has really helped me. I, I consider Tori Amos and Tom Petty's music to be friends of mine. I met Tori a few times in person and gave her hand-painted shoes that I made, and she wore them in 1996 at the Paramount Theater in Seattle. She thanked me on stage. I mean, that, that was a highlight of my life, one of the highlights of my life. Uh, but I've had a lot of traumatic experiences in my life, and which I don't really want to dwell on. I had an abortion in 1996 or 95. I can't even remember now what year that was. And I had just different shocking things. Lately, I've had to move every few years because they keep raising the rent, which is another reason why I am so happy I have Section 8 rent. My rent is only a third of my income right now, which is what I think everyone, I wish everybody could get only a third of their income being their rent instead of, you know, people paying most of their money for rent. And then whatever money they have left over, they buy food and they go to the food bank and the thrift store. You know, a lot of Americans live in poverty. And I consider Donald Trump and his people embezzlers and money hoarders and basically economic terrorists. But I was going to say, a lot of what you do when you have post-traumatic stress disorder is compensation. I notice that me, I compensate, like I consider my whole goddess Kring thing to be like the Wizard of Oz. And like Shannon feels like this little shy nine-year-old kid that's kind of stuck at being about age nine. Nine is the age where my mom and I left California and I was really like stressed out about it and scared. And I didn't want to leave my dad and my grandparents and my school and my, my house and my sunshine and my ocean and my friends. And it was just really stressful. And then my mom and I lived in our car and then we lived with a boyfriend of hers and then we lived in a trailer in the middle of the woods and it was dark and moldy and wet and I was scared and I wanted to go back to San Diego and I had a lump in my belly for quite a while about that and thankfully my dad and grandparents visited and my mom had all kinds of weird boyfriends that she, you know, she was trying really hard to find a guy to settle down with so we would be secure financially but that just didn't work out. And so she kept, you know, dating guys and marrying. She married a few times and it just didn't really work out too well. So basically she did the best she could, but I'm not here to bash my mom. My mom is a very intelligent person. She's into, you know, Eastern philosophy and she's like a very deep thinker and she's really earthy and natural and she's really a talented artist. Uh, but I will say that the way she raised me was kind of harmful to me in terms of my self-esteem being really insecure and I have like a lack of sense of, you know, I like to say um, intimacy chasing me, feel like it's erasing me. And I say fragile sense of self, intangible desire for wealth. So authentic ejaculation of my soul, molten orange, liquid glow, anger takes its toll, blowing status quo. These are all poems that I write that I've written about my personal demons and just having a fragile sense of self. And I just can't seem to get over my childhood. I can't seem to get over, not really my childhood, but feeling like I'm still a nine-year-old kid who lives alone in an apartment. But the thing is, I don't want to live with anybody else. I've, I've never really had roommates. I lived with two different boyfriends, but that just didn't work out too well for me. And I way, way, way more calm when I'm by myself. So I'm a little bit lonely sometimes, but I do have a boyfriend We've been seeing each other for about two and a half years, and he's amazingly, uh, he's very different than me. He eats meat. He doesn't recycle. He's way more conservative than me, but he, he's, he's a bit insensitive. But the thing is, if he was as sensitive as me, he probably would not be able to handle dating me because I'm so moody. So the fact that he's a little bit insensitive compared to me is probably what helps him be strong enough to date me. So, I mean, I'm a good person in some ways, but I will say that my compensation skills, I feel like I am a workaholic. 
I, I consider my work my life raft. I consider my website, my artwork, my OCD, my obsessive compulsive disorder is channeled into my modeling schedule. My schedule is cram packed full for like the last 25 years. I print my own calendars with my artwork on them. And it's a strength of mine. So actually, maybe that means that I'm a bit of a genius because I'm really insecure and I think about suicide sometimes. And yet, I'm a really strong stoic figure model. I always show up. I always do a good job for them. No matter what mood I'm in, I can always model because it's like getting paid to meditate and it's like getting paid basically to sort of disassociate a little bit and space out and meditate or daydream. And my job is just to be still and quiet and strike interesting poses and hold really still. And sometimes it's like 30 second action poses that I get to change every 30 seconds and they draw me and paint me and sculpt me. And other times it's one pose for four hours or three hours. So for the whole session, one pose, but we get breaks every 20 minutes. So basically figure modeling is perfect because I have post-traumatic stress disorder and it calms me down. When I make money, I feel safe. I was going to say that I'm low income and the way that I survive in this cutthroat USA is I feel kind of trapped though because I owe $67,000 for my bachelor's degree and I'm on income-based repayment, which means I pay zero. So like I'm not in trouble with the student loan people. I tell them, I show them my income tax every year and I go, look, I'm still low income. And so my income-based repayment is zero. So I'm officially allowed to pay nothing because I figure what's the point in paying? It's not even going to make a dent in the 67000 So when I die, poof, my student loans die with me. So if you owe money on student loans and you're struggling to pay, I would say find out if you can get income-based repayment, meaning you could pay zero. If you're low income enough, you can pay zero or 50 bucks a month not like $600 a month. I know some people have to pay $600 a month on their student loans, which is ridiculous because you could pay that for years and years and years and still not be done. So what's the point? So I figure just pay nothing if I can get away with it. So right now I pay zero because I'm low income, which means I make about 1500 bucks a month. And I have a uh, section eight housing because of my low income. And so my rent is a third of my income. So I basically, but I feel scared because I feel like I definitely don't want to be any more poor than I am because I want to make sure I can pay all my bills. I don't have any credit card debt. I, I have good credit except for my student loans. I have very good history with, I have a car loan that I'm almost done paying. I pay all my bills on time every single month. I always pay my bills. I'm never late. I've never bounced a check. I have good credit. So I'm like really hyper vigilant about paying all my bills on time. I get no help from my parents. My parents love me. Uh, my mom couldn't help me if, even if she wanted to because she can't afford it because she's, she's really in a tight situation financially. My dad can afford to help me. Um, and he actually did buy Tom Petty tickets for he and I, which was very nice of him. And he flew me to Santa Barbara recently. That's really nice of him. Um, but he, he wants me to be as independent as I can. So if I'm ever in a life or death emergency situation, he'll help me if he can. Uh, but there's kind of some guilt and shame there for asking for help. I basically feel guilty and ashamed if I ask for help from my parents. So I don't really feel like it's, it's fair um, to feel the way that I feel. I feel like a burden. So I try to be as independent as I can. And so the way I compensate for being so scared, I don't really have close friends and I don't really trust people. I, it's amazing I even have a boyfriend. Uh, I, I put all of my energy, I, I'm really good with my cat. I feed him raw food, raw frozen meat food. And I'm, I have a bunch of house plants. And so I have a really good relationship with my cat and my plants and music and art and my website, I put all my energy into my modeling career, my full-time freelance career that I've done for 25 years. I've been full-time modeling for 20 years. I used to have a part-time job at a Xerox place from 94 to 97, but 92 is when I first got involved in figure modeling. 
And so for 25 years, I have been figure modeling. And so I put all of my energy into that, into nutrition and exercise, my website. And I've recently been re-triggered because my cat had a tragic death. My cat Stella died a tragic death of liver failure. And I was injecting her with fluids and trying to help her, but then she died anyway. That was awful. And my stepdad died suddenly and I had to move. And I just, I got triggered. My post-traumatic stress disorder got triggered by having to move so many times in the last few years. And so I keep going back and forth between talking about my childhood and talking post-traumatic stress and then talking about Donald Trump. I feel like the the new USA administration, their money embezzlers, their, their, um, economic terrorists as far as I can tell and they want to hoard all the money and lie to us and say they can't afford to help alleviate poverty you know I'm a democratic socialist you know I want the the uh, wages raised for the low income and the poor and I want Medicare and Medicaid expanded social security could be expanded I want the wealthy to pay their fair share of taxes like they used to do decades ago I want money put into mass transit, high-speed trains, fix the roads, fix the bridges, fix the infrastructure. I want healthcare to be nonprofit, universal, single payer, like it is for my friends in Europe, my friend in Norway, my friend in Scotland, my friend even in Russia, and my friend in England. So I am very upset the way the bankers run things and price gouging in medicine is really a crime against humanity. Our defense budget is already way too large. Jacking it up another $54 billion seems totally insane to me. A friend of mine said he thinks that some of the small European countries appreciate the United States for picking up the slack and having a big military because they have small militaries and I beg to differ. If there's any European listening right now, do you like how big the American military is? Or do you think it's disgusting? Because I think it's disgusting. So I think we should shrink our military. We should help the veterans, give them really good health care. I mean, really, every American should get single-payer nonprofit health care. You know, whether you're a veteran or a regular civilian, young, poor, sick, old, um, wealthy, poor, sick, healthy, etc., so I think it's sad that, that we think healthcare needs to be part of our capitalist system. That's really unethical and a crime. And I wish there were large solar power plants everywhere and we would w- fix the water, put millions of dollars into fixing the water. Imagine if we put $54 billion into building solar power plants, into having electric cars, into I know somebody who has a fully electric smart car and on one charge it'll go a hundred miles which I think is pretty good and I think they do even have some electric cars now that go up to 250 miles maybe that's in France or somewhere in Europe also in Europe they have stricter laws about chemicals and toxic chemicals and in, in the United States we allow all kinds of weird toxic chemicals to be put into beauty products and food and in Europe, they ban a lot of those same chemicals. So it makes me want to move back to, to uh, Europe. My people came on my dad's side, I think in 1866, from Sweden and Norway, mostly Norway on my dad's side. And my mom's people came, I think, in the late, like maybe almost 1900 or late 1800s, sooner, I think, than my dad's people uh, from Ireland, England, and Scotland on my mom's side, and again from Sweden and Norway on my dad's side. So I kind of wish that my people had stayed in Europe, but I don't know. But I've looked into revoking my American citizenship, but it sounds very complicated and a little dangerous because then you're not a citizen of any country and you have to find a job. It seems like the only way for really me to move to Europe would be to fall in love with and marry a wonderful European person. But I could never marry just to do that. For one thing, it's illegal. But also, I would need to love somebody to really marry them. And I've never really felt like I could trust marriage. I saw my mom get married four times. And my dad's been married twice. And never mind. I don't come from a family where marriage was modeled to me in a good way. But I don't have any brothers or sisters. And I never had kids. And so 
Um, I don't really have a big family, so I don't know. I don't really have family, but I have a mom and a dad and that's it. And I have my kitty and I have my boyfriend who I definitely don't want to marry and he doesn't believe in marriage anyway. So he and I definitely are not going to get married and I don't think I ever want to live with him. I don't think I ever want to live with any guy. So I think I need to live on my own for the rest of my life. So I'm 48 now, so we'll see. Maybe I'll change. Maybe I'll heal. I don't know. Or maybe I am just a loner and that's okay. Uh, but I'll say that I feel trapped. I feel kind of like I'm low income, uh, but I live kind of like a middle class because my expenses are fairly low. I mean, I live as cheap as I can. So even when I went to England uh, a year and a half ago, I spent as little money as I could. I stayed with my English friend in his flat near Liverpool. And I have an online job that I can do in other countries. And I made $236 online at his house in England. And I pay, you know, American taxes on that. And I, because it's an internet job, you it's okay to do it in other countries. And so I was able to, you know, I worked though. I was so tired. Like I was supposed to be on vacation on holiday visiting my friend in England. And I ended up working when I was there uh, because I was so afraid of spending money. Uh, so, but I hardly spent anything. I think I was there for 10 or 14 days and it was like really inexpensive. My airline ticket was the most expensive thing. And I flew in and out of Vancouver, Canada, which was a big hassle, but, um, from Seattle to Vancouver to, and I didn't go to Heathrow. I landed in Gatwick airport, which is really far away. I'll never do that again. When I went to England, I will never do that again. So I will land in Heathrow next time because it's closer to Liverpool. Or land in Liverpool, although that's more expensive. So I'll probably just land in uh, Heathrow. So I just wanted to say that it's amazing that I've been able to visit Europe about eight times. I mean, it's amazing when I think about my post-traumatic stress and how freaked out I get. And yet I'm able to compensate for all of my fears and my insecurities because I found modeling. I found art modeling. And I don't know what I'm going to do about my student loans. I owe 67000 and I'm on income-based repayment, which means I can pay zero because I'm low income enough. And my Section 8 rent depends on me being low income. And my health care depends on me being low income. So basically in the United States, I live like a middle class person because my life is really cheap. I drink mostly water and I shop at like Costco and Trader Joe's and I get really good deals and I'm a bargain hunter. I go to the food bank, I go to the thrift store. Uh, sometimes I qualify for food stamps off and on, you know, sometimes they take them away and then they give them back and it's like whatever, it's up and down on a roller coaster. And so I do whatever I can to live as cheap as I possibly can. And I was also traumatized when my apartment got broken into in the summer and uh, my cameras were stolen. And I did a fundraiser and I was able to, thanks to some of my fans, I was able to replace most of my cameras with different cameras. I didn't really recover the cost of what I lost, but it's good enough for me. So I'm really grateful that I have cameras again and that I'm healing from that trauma of being broken into. Uh, my car window got smashed. I'm healing from that trauma. That was a long time ago. But that was shocking. And uh, what else? Just shocking things have happened to me. And so I think every time, I think if you have post-traumatic stress disorder from childhood events, when you're a little kid, you're very impressionable. And then when you're an adult, like everyone goes through some kind of trauma, like, you know, people in your family die or a pet dies or there's a car accident or, you know, just something shocking happens in life. It's, it's impossible for it not to happen. And you're traumatized. I mean, everyone gets traumatized by scary events that happen. But I think when you have post-traumatic stress from an early age, you're maybe more triggered by these traumatic events as an adult. So I think that some of the traumatic things that have happened to me as an adult in the last five or 10 years have triggered my post-traumatic stress from childhood. So I've had flashbacks of various things from my childhood. So I'm sharing this because this is my audio diary. You're listening to Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring podcast number 23. This is March 23rd, 2017. So I am a multimedia artist. ShannonKringen.com is my website. This is a hollow earth radio you're listening to. Thank you for having me. This is Goddess Kring on hollow earth radio. Thanks for tuning in. And 
station identification. And I also archive this for free on my Patreon, Mixcloud, Bandcamp, and YouTube. And if you watch, if you listen to this on YouTube, you also get to watch slideshow of my visual art, which is mostly selfies I've taken, as well as photos of animals and urban decay and landscapes, beautiful artwork photos, photos that I've taken, as well as abstract drawings and paintings I've done sometimes. And sometimes it's photos of me modeling that other people have taken photos of me. So, but mostly if it's a picture of me, I probably took it. Mostly it's selfies. The best photos I think that are, have ever been taken of me are the ones I take of myself. And that's because I'm most comfortable and relaxed with myself more than I am in posing for other photographers. Although I do love posing for drawing and painting people. So I will also say that I think 9-11 was a planned demo. Three towers went down that day. They all fell at free fall speed, symmetrically crushed to powder. There's no way that I believe that airplanes could cause the damage that could make those three towers pancake. There's a Tori Amos song called Pancake, which I'm pretty sure is about 9-11 and it came out in 2001, coincidentally. Scarlet's Walk, check it out, Pancake by Tori Amos, great song. So, yeah, well, I think 9-11 was done by I don't know who, and I think airplanes really did hit those towers, but I think what made those towers, all three of them, one at 5.20 p.m., building number nine, came down completely symmetrically, all exactly the same even though they all three had different damage levels. So, and then the firefighter said that two or three weeks after 9-11, there was still molten lava type heat under that area, which is not natural for a fire of just jet fuel. So thermite or therm thermate or thermite, explosive things that they can use to detonate buildings definitely would explain. Let's just say that they never tested for explosives but if 9-11, let's just entertain the thought, if 9-11 was done by explosives, thermite or thermate or whatever it's called, if 9-11 was done by explosives that were put in those towers sometime before that day, what it would have looked like would have been coincidentally exactly what we saw. So imagine that. So it actually fits. So whatever. I know a lot of people don't agree with me on this. But I know there's other architects and engineers who agree with me on this, that 9-11 was a planned demo. And I just wonder if the current new Trump administration is planning another or maybe not planning to do anything in this country and pretend like it was an attack from somebody else. But maybe they are cooperating with somebody who is willing to attack the United States so they can make up excuses of why they need more martial law or to take away more civil liberties or to really justify that $54 billion beef up of the military when we already have $900 billion military budget, which is hard to even imagine it's that even. I, I recently, I don't even remember the statistics, but I recently read what our military budget is, and it's way higher than I ever imagined it could possibly be. So to jack it up another $54 billion is totally insane, if you ask me, and a big waste of money and a sad way to spend money. You know, Martin Luther King said, any nation that spends more on military defense and cuts social programs is approaching spiritual death. You know, the greatest speech that I ever heard Martin Luther King do was his Beyond Vietnam speech, was a, which was a way more than about civil rights. It was definitely about racism and ending racism, but it was also about ending poverty and war and the military industrial complex. And he pointed out to refer to the Viet Cong as the enemy and just kill them all is really, really not a very spiritually enlightened way to behave. And then to just blame the enemy, which is why I'm really afraid of Trump because I see him as the new Hitler. He's more of an economic terrorist than maybe an actual terrorist that wants to kill people. But 
to label us versus them, to label the good guys and the bad guys, and to pretend like the United States is always the good guy is really dangerous. Just like when Israel, when Israel annihilates Palestinians and then justifies it and says, well, we had to do that because they want to get us, then you become like that. If you say, well, those are the bad people, so we need to kill them before they kill us, then you become just like them. So then you stoop to that level of just killing. So who's the real terrorist? When you fight terror with terror, then you have more terror. So wasn't it also Martin Luther King that said, you can't drive out hate with more hate. You have to have love. So somebody has to rise above the hate and find a way to love and, to, and have compassion and take away Listen to the concerns of your enemy. I think Martin Luther King also said, listen to the concerns of your enemy. Instead of labeling them as bad people who want to get you, ask them. Maybe there are some people in the world that are sociopaths and there's nothing you can say that's re that will, you know, you can't reason with some people. Maybe they do just want to kill other people, you know. But most people... If you ask them why they're upset, like crime, like I feel like the more we have poverty in the United States, the higher the crime levels are going to be. I feel like if you take away reasons why people are so upset, like if, if people wouldn't live in such poverty in this country, if we had universal health care to the point where nobody had to worry about medical bills. I mean, it breaks my heart that when somebody has cancer, they don't only have to worry about chemotherapy and how that's going to physically affect them and their health and their family and their job. They also have to worry about their medical bills and have fundraisers. I mean, no other country do you have to have fundraisers to pay your medical bills. That's totally cruel and abusive. And then they lie to us and say that, is if we can't afford to cover everybody. I mean, chemotherapy does not need to cost $90,000. It doesn't in other countries. In the UK, it does not cost $90,000 or whatever it costs. I don't know how much it costs. But I recently saw somebody online that I know that needs like a liver transplant and he's doing a fundraiser and people are helping him and I'm really happy that he's getting help. But it's sad that we live in a culture that even needs to have medical fundraisers for people. That's so sad. So, so basically, I feel like if you take away reason, if, if we don't have as much poverty, if people had universal health care and better social services and rent control and like so that if your rent was only a third of your income, more homeless shelters or more little shacks for homeless people to live in, you know, those little tiny homes that homeless people can live in, you know, less misery, less anger, less, less dog eat dog competitive society. I feel like people wouldn't be as angry and there'd probably be less crime. That's one theory anyway. So thank you for listening. My name is Shannon Kring and you're listening to Goddess Kring, radio podcast number 23 on Hollow Earth Radio. Okay, Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring podcast number 23 on Hollow Earth Radio. March 23rd, 2017. Thanks for tuning in. I feel so much better now. I was a bit stressed earlier today. I, mo I figure modeled for seven hours today, four hours at one school, three hours at another place. And I just got back from a 30 minute walk in my neighborhood. I love walking by myself and saw some cool dogs and I had a massage. I went to this Chinese massage place in the central district in Seattle and for an amazing deal of $27, I got a full body acupressure slash foot massage and it really helped me feel a little better, get more alpha waves or beta, theta, whatever kind of waves in my brain to get me more relaxed. And I was just thinking about the traveling I've done. I've been to Brisbane, Australia, and that was my first overseas trip. And so I think I want to talk about how much I love massage and why and how it's very healing and soothing to me, body, mind, heart, and soul. I sometimes think about going to massage school. And I wanted to talk about the traveling I've done, visiting friends 
in Australia and England and Norway. And I've gone to Italy and France and Belgium and Scotland and all kinds of interesting places. But I think I'm going to call it a night and continue recording this after I get a good night's sleep. I so much love to travel overseas, would like to do more of it again. I was going on a trip almost every year, went to England last time, went to the Bahamas the time before that, went to Santa Barbara, California a, few, a couple times recently to visit relatives. Traveling helps me keep kind of a fresh perspective and keeps me more in the present moment because I tend to obsess about the past and the future quite a bit. Again, I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder to some extent, although I don't really think anybody needs to be trapped in a label. We do have neuroplasticity in our brains. I just had such a good walk, and I think I just want to call it a night. So I will continue this. Thanks for tuning in. Goddess Kring Podcast, Hollow Earth Radio. Narcissism. Schism. Schism. Prism. Prism. Rhythm. Rhythm. Drizzling. Drizzling. Empathy for the predator. For the predator. Empathy for the predator. For the predator. Empathy for the predator. Predator. Sympathy for the deviator. Villain hater. Villain hater. Look in the mirror. 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 Shadow projector. Shadow projector. Projector. Repot the plan. Repot the plan. Repot the plan. Stand solo. Solitude. Solitude. Alone. Alone. All one. All one. Wash away the fur dump. Eyes are fertile. Lies are fertile. Fertilizer. Fertilizer. Rise up. Rise up. Why is self-acceptance so hard? So hard. Silence. Silence. Solitude. Solitude. Relax. Relax. Rest. Relax. Rest. Digest. Digest. The mess. The mess. Order. 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 Empathy for the predator. Narcissism. 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 Prism. Prism. Drizzling. 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 Sunshine blows through. Clear the house. Clear the house. Repot the plan. Repot the plan. Fertilizer. Eyes are fertile. Eyes are fertile. Eyes are fertile. Fertilizer. 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 Scattered in this chatter, feeling like the mad hatter. What to do? What to do? And I'm feeling so blue. I don't know what to do. And I'm feeling so blue. I don't know what to do. Sitting here with my kitty Kisun on my lap, debating, berating, placating, vacationing, not, vacationing, not, working a lot, modeling for art classes 95% of the time, and then 5% of the time. Delivering groceries for a living. Really hard work, really stressful. Really learning how to use Google Maps really, really well. So this is Shannon Kring and you're listening to Goddess Kring podcast number 23 on March 23rd, 2017. I am extremely depressed right now. Last night I got home. And I was feeling really good. I got a nice massage. And I had seven days of figure modeling. And now today, I'm having a bit of a time management stress feeling. So I think I might close this podcast out with some spoken word poetry. 
Again, my name is Shannon Kringen. My website, this is Hollow Earth Radio, Goddess Kring Podcast Radio, Experimental, Improvisational Monologue and Poetry and Spoken Word and Strange Music from time to time. I'm really happy and proud that the Seattle Public Library has Sing Kringnicity, which is several tracks that I did with Claxton Kent from Portland. And it's my lyrics and voice and Claxton's uh, instrumental to back me up in his cute little recording studio in Portland. We created that a few years back in 2014, I think. And I'm really happy and proud about that. Uh, But I feel kind of like up and down cyclothymia. My moods go up and down. I have a little hypomania and then I have depressions that come and go. And I'm never so severely pressed that I stay in bed all day, but I'm never so manic that I stay up all night either or think I can fly or, or go to Paris or whatever. Although I have been to Paris. I've been to Europe several times. I thought I was going to get up this morning and talk about my many trips to Europe and Australia. I went to Australia once. I would love to go to Brisbane, Australia again, and or Sydney, which I've never been to. I've been to various places in Europe. Maybe my next podcast, I'll talk about some of the interesting experiences I had uh, going to Europe about eight different times over the last 20 years, visiting friends, Uh, couchsurfing.com staying with random strangers who host me I love to travel it's especially refreshing to leave the United States and get a fresh perspective of the United States because when you live in this country it's easy to think that this is the only country in the world like we're so uh, national centric or whatever they call that so it's just nice to see this country from a different perspective and also just feel what it's like to live in another country and eat different food and use different transportation and just kind of feel and soak up the energy. So I think I'm going to go for a walk and here is some Kring music as I close out. I'll see you next week. Go to shannonkringen.com if you want to listen to music that I've done, band camp has a bunch of my mp3s and my photos are on Flickr and Instagram and all over the place so go to shannonkringen.com and it links to everything and feel free to email me with questions or comments thanks for tuning in I'll see you next week I hope you find this interesting or inspiring in some way and if you'd like to record get a microphone and audacity and make a podcast and publish it it's pretty fun I love doing this thanks for listening have a good blissful day or night be yourself no matter what they say authentic ejaculation of your soul molten orange liquid glow anger takes its toll blowing status quo to and fro bada boo bada bing stinging rings the kring catch the wind song spiral drive crack the code left and right node adios Arrivederci, aloha, afirsen, konnichiwa, sayonara. So bye for, bye for now. I'll see you next week. Or I'll, I'll hear you next week. Or you'll hear me next week on the Goddess Kring podcast on Hollow Earth Radio Seattle. Freedom and embracing grace. Cranberry moon drops, cranberry moon dream. High bloom through the roots in cahoots, sliding doors, eyes adore, ocean beam, come clean, come clean, manifesting dreams, black fire feather rain, strain the stream of consciousness again, volcano ash erupting green, enchanted fingers filter rain, Down the drain, in chains, again. Cranberry moon drops, cranberry moon dream. High bloom through the roots, in cahoots. Sliding doors, eyes adore. Ocean beam, come clean, come clean. Manifesting dreams. Black fire feather rain, strain the stream of consciousness again. Volcano ash 
erupting green, enchanted fingers filter rain down the drain in chains again. Cranberry moon drops, cranberry moon dream, high bloom through the roots in cahoots. Sliding doors, eyes adore. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring.